All right, welcome everybody. My name is Nick Hershon. I'm a journalism professor at William Patterson University in New Jersey, and I'm the advisor of our student chapter, the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to our book talk today with Dr. Marilyn Greenwald, my dissertation director at Ohio University, <laughs> and my former uh, classmate, colleague at OU, Yoon Lee. They are the authors of the new book, Eunice Hutton Carter, A Lifelong Fight for Social Justice. So we're going to be talking about that book uh, later on. And I know a lot of you are here today because you're friends of the authors, and you may not know much about our SBJ chapter. So if you just give me a moment since we are sponsoring this event, this is the final event in an academic year when the Society of Professional Journalists named us the nation's top campus chapter of SBJ. And if you'd like to learn more about us, please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, at WPSBJ. We do have some students who are here today. And for those students in attendance, we're going to be giving away a free copy of this book after the presentation. So if you just hang on, you'll be eligible for that. We're going to do a fun Kahoot style quiz that anybody can join in if you want to. Kahoot is an interactive game. You just log on to your phone. So if you might want to get your smartphones handy so you can log on and I'll walk you through it a little bit later on. Uh, just to note that we are recording this session. We plan to post it later on to YouTube. We might splice some of it for social media posts. So if your face is on screen right now, there's a chance that you might appear in that recording later on, just so everybody is aware. All right. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen soon, and we will throw it over to Dr. Greenwald to start. Now, Dr. Greenwald, would you like me to share the screen at the beginning of your presentation, or would you like to speak a little bit before I do? Um, you, you can share it now. I mean, it's it doesn't really matter right now, but yeah, thanks for asking though. Sure, of course. So I'll share my screen and then uh, you will hear Dr. Greenwald start our presentation. Thank you. And I, I, before I say anything, I want everyone to know that I insist that these people call me Dr. Greenwald. No, actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, have told, I have told you and, and Nick many times to call me Marilyn, but- And we refuse. No, and they stick. refuse. So that, that I just want to want. Um, <laughs> You know, the only, I, I should say the only person I don't insist to call me Dr. Greenwald is my husband. No, no, that, I'm kidding about that. Um, okay, I, thank you, Nick. Um, one thing really quickly, and I, I, I know we're, we're already a little late, so I wanna get on the book, but um, Nick, Nick is, is pretty modest. And yes, I was his dissertation advisor and his dissertation, he turned his dissertation into a book almost immediately, if you don't know, it take, most people don't turn their dissertations into books and it usually takes years and years. And he did it, I, I, I think within a year. And it's great, it, it's, it's a, a book about the a branding experiment, I guess, of the New York Islanders. And you know that you don't have to be a sports fan to like it because I am not a sports fan and I, it, it's excellent. So I, I, I just do want to, He's a little bit modest, so I, I do want to say that. And the chapter itself, um, a lot of people who aren't in journalism don't know, but if, if you get named chapter of the year as a student chapter, that's like winning an Oscar. I mean, there are just many, many student chapters. So, so that's quite an honor to get that, that nationally. So the, the, in fact, um, some national journalists congratulated them, including Lester Holt and Chris Wallace. I mean, that's what a huge kind of achievement is. Thank so, you. So um, with that in mind, um, I, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to talk about Eunice. We're not necessarily going to go in chronological order at the beginning, you know, because I think sometimes these things, you know, she was born and then she was eight years old and so, we're, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to kind of play with the chronology a little bit, I think, because a lot of people are interested in the mob, you know, and, and, and Eunice's role in the mob. Um, although as I hope you'll feel at the end of this talk that, that there are many, many other interesting aspects of, of Eunice, and there are. And I'm just gonna do an introduction and then throw it over to you. And, but the, the way we got the idea for this book, and it is in the introduction to the book, um, it was just a fluky thing. I was in Las Vegas actually for a wedding of my niece and we were killing some time and we, someone said, go to the Mob Museum there. And I didn't know what it was. No one knew what it was. Well, it's great. If you're ever in Vegas, go to the Mob Museum. It's this trillion dollar facility. It's great. It's, it's like any, as interesting as any museum, you know, in the, in the Smithsonian, um, all about the mob, obviously. And, um, you know, take, take three hours though. I mean, that's how big it is. But anyway, you can imagine they had one room in there about the sensational trial of 1936, 1935 and 1936, I guess the trial in 36, and all about Tom Dewey, the prosecutor, and they nabbed Lucky Luciano. 
it was called the trial of the century, which of course there are a lot of trials of the century. <laughs> this was one of them. So they had a whole room devoted to this. It was really interesting. So along the one wall, they had all, they had the team of the 20 hot lawyers who nabbed Lucky Luciano and they had framed pictures of them led by Tom Dewey. And we're looking at these photos and they're these, you know, youngish guys, all white, of course, white guy, white guy, white guy, white guy. And then we're looking and then we see a black woman, you know, this photo of a black woman. And, you know, we, we immediately, my family, we all looked at each other and said, there's got to be a story behind that. In the 1930s, you know, how many black people were even attorneys in the 1930s? How many black women? I mean, you know, you could go on and on and on. I was working on another project. So fast forward to a couple years later, and this is where Ewan comes in and I was doing some um, research on Eunice. And while she was interesting and the trial was interesting, I thought, I don't think this is a whole book. It's just, there's not enough there, you know? So Ewan and I were talking, um, Ewan is a dogged researcher and reporter. She works for CNBC. And so she's, you know, using that for her job now, but, but back then she used it you know, for us, for a project. And she found out some really interesting things about Thomas Dewey, how he manipulated the press, which she'll get into. Um, we found out that um, Eunice had really interesting relatives who were like, you know, pioneers in social justice movements to the point they, they were, they, you know, their lives were on the line. I don't think that's an exaggeration to say that. So that's when we said, hey, this, this may indeed be enough for a whole book. Um, and, and when I say their lives are on the line, I'll just tell you what I mean and then throw it over to you. And um, Eunice's grandfather was a slave and he was a slave in Virginia and he purchased his own freedom. So he wanted to leave the country. And I don't, I learned a lot about, you know, th that part, you know, that time on it, um, in the South, I didn't know a lot about it. And you could have purchased your own freedom, but in the South, they could have returned you. I mean, so you, if, even if you were a quote free person, you wanted to get out of there. So he went to Canada, a little village in Canada that was on the line of the um, Underground Railroad. And there's a little community called Chatham there about an hour north of, of Detroit. And he became wealthy. He, he, he became a landlord, he owned buildings, he became an abolitionist, had nine children. Um, the sixth was a boy named William. William was Eunice's um, father. William was active in the YMCA in Canada. They were obviously Canadian. And they, he did such a good job. They said, you know, we want to put you, we want to make you an executive in the division called the Colored Men's Division. You will go down south to the Southern United States and you'll integrate the YMCAs there, you know, so black people can use them. He did it, but you, can you imagine being black in, you know, at the turn of the century, even before, integrating that. So, so his life was fascinating. And also he put his life on the line. He met Eunice's mother, um, also very, you know, socially or, um, active in social causes. Eunice got a lot of her determination from her mother, which, which I'll get into, you know, in a couple of minutes. So this family was at, it was amazing. Um, in addition to the fact that Eunice is, you know, dealing with these brutal criminals. Um, one quick thing, you and I, we, when we talked about the um, mob trial, it was, there were parts of it that were actually kind of funny. I mean, you know, the mobsters had funny names. Um, Lucky Luciano wore what would be today like $3,000 suits. You know, he had like $1,000 shoes. I mean, he lived, he lived very, very high. So, so we have a combination of, you know, kind of murder and, and um, some funny things, and then some extremely serious aspects, race riots, um, you know, and as I said, working, being black and, and, you know, working in the era of Jim Crow in the South, which, you know, so that's why we were so um, interested in this topic. And that's why we joined to, um, to, to do a book on it. And Ewan is going to give you some information about um, Lucky Luciano and his arch enemy, Thomas Dewey. Great. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say um, it's such an honor and privilege for me to be working on this project with you, Dr. Greenwald. And thank you so much for your support and your mentorship over the years. I really appreciate um, everything you do. Thank you so much. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the mob and just to set the scene a little bit. I think we all have an idea of you know what the what the mob and the underworld looks like just from you know the movies and TV shows that we watch like Goodfellas and The Godfather, and in fact by the 1920s and early 30s, organized crime had become this very sophisticated and multi-layered operation in New York City. And after a wave of immigrants who entered the city, you know, there were different groups of gangsters who um, took control of different parts of Manhattan and Queens and different boroughs in New York City. So for example, the Irish led the West Side, the Jewish and Italian gangsters control the East Side. So it's very prevalent, it's very widespread. The organized crime controlled and affected everybody's daily lives. They ran different rackets in the city um, and the mob charged an official sales tax on just about everything, you know, from um, daily grocery items like your, you know, meat to vegetables to, you know, gasoline and automobiles. So it was very, very bad back then. And look, Luciano, of who of course was part of the Ital Italian mafia, um, he actually very quickly became a leading figure in the underworld because he came in and he thought that if they wanted to go big, they have to sort of unionize and they have to work together, different groups of the mobsters, they have to work together instead of against each other, right? And they have to end these sort of turf wars and try to maximize the profits. So he proposed a structure where different groups would work under one umbrella, you know, Jewish, Irish, Italian. So he really um, uh, proposed this new structure and make this crime scene really organized, so to speak. And, you know, law enforcement and a lot of government officials, they've been trying for years to try to crack down the rackets in the city. But, you know, it was never an easy task just because how many of the people in the government in the government were actually corrupt and they actually had uh, was tie, were tied to the mob. So it's just impossible to try them in court. And up until that point, any prominent figure in the underworld, they had only been convicted of tax evasion at most. So none of them have been um, convicted of the crime they were actually committing, you, you know? And so, and here's how Dewey came into the picture. Um, if we wanna, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, so by 1935, the crime got so out of control, right? And to the point where um, the governor of New York back then, Herbert Lehman, he decided that he wanted to appoint a special prosecutor to really lead a big investigation and crack down all, the, all these crimes. And Dewey, um, he had just turned 30 years old and he was working at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and he helped. Uh, he was working on a couple cases involving the mob, um, and so when the governor was trying to come up with candidates for this job, Dewey was the only nominee proposed by the New York Bar Association, and he quickly took the job. And um, actually, a day after he was sworn in. Dewey decided that he wanted to give a radio speech to um, talk about his plan um, and to give, you know, details about his investigation. And, you know, back then he was faced with a lot of skepticism from the public because, you know, a lot of people have tried to uh, crack it down, really try to um, fight the underworld, but nobody had done anything real, you know, concrete. So he felt the need to really set the record straight and address the public directly. And one of the things that Dewey made very clear in his speech was that he wanted um, the press, he wanted the media to leave him alone. He didn't want to talk about his investigation. He only wanted to focus on this job, on his, invest, on his work. Um, he actually said he wanted to vanish from the newspapers 
he said, and I quote, a talking prosecutor is not a working prosecutor. Crime cannot be investigated under a spotlight. So he made it very clear that he, he's not going to answer any questions. He's going to keep it very quiet. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, a lot of um, the editors from top New York newspapers, you know, the Times, uh, the Post, Daily News, and World Telegram, which I think no longer exists. So they, they actually all applauded him for that. He, they actually sent him letters afterwards saying that they fully understand why he wanted to stay quiet. They're willing to cooperate and they will be at his service, which when I was doing the research, I thought it was really interesting and surprising because I just can't imagine something like that would happen today. You know, if say de Blasio wanted to launch an investigation and he's like, I'm not depressed, please leave me alone. And editors won't be calling him up and be like, we totally understand. We will not ask you a single question. <laughs> so the relationship between the press and officials were was very different back then. And it was very interesting. Um, and I think let's go back a little bit. Um, and we, yeah, we'll tell you a little bit about how Eunice came into the picture and her background and her family history. Okay. Yeah, you know, when I just, and, and I do want to get to her family in a minute, What when you and you were saying, can you imagine that the editor's going, okay, yeah, sounds good, we won't write anything <laughs> about you, you know. Um, when you remember the the Mueller, the Mueller investigation, I which know. happened actually after you and, I, you and I worked together, remember they were saying, oh, there were no leaks, there were no leaks, that's almost unheard of. That's almost, <laughs> I thought of Dewey when I, when I kept yeah. hearing <laughs> I th In fact, I think and you and I, when we were talking during that, we were we were comparing Mueller with with Dewey. I'm afraid Dewey was a, a little more successful, but okay. Anyway, that's another story. Um, yeah, I, I just want to get into um, Eunice's family a little bit. That that's her grandfather, who I mentioned that that fought his own freedom, moved to Chatham, Ontario, in, and and the little village that he lived in. It was this, the people were writers, artists. They were almost well. Mo many of them, I guess I should say, were were former slaves, and they formed this this little community. Uh, really fascinating, and they all they did very well, you know. And so it, it 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 was, I guess, sad when you think of the history of the United States that these these people had had to go there to do this. But but Stanton Hunton was was one of the the key members of that little community. That's his son, William Hunton who I said was, you know, a member of the top member of one of the executive um, offices of the YMCA, sent him down to the South to integrate the Ys. Um, you know, he he was a really an interesting guy. I, I, I have read, well, hundreds of letters that he wrote that he wrote while he was on the road that he wrote to Eunice's mother. And he was really pretty stoic. I mean, you know, they were, sometimes he could, sit anywhere on a train. Sometimes he had a sit in segregated area. I mean, just the, sometimes people were fine to him. Sometimes they weren't. Um, he, he, he was never hurt doing that, but, but a lot of indignities and he kind of glossed over them in some of the letters. And, and so I guess he, he was a very, he was very spiritual. He was relatively religious. Ewan wasn't per se, but, but William was. And I think he got a lot of comfort from, from that. Um, so he goes down in the South and then Nick, if you want to, um, yeah. Okay. So that's Addie. That's not a great picture, but Addie Waits Hunton is Eunice's mother. And I'll get to the world war one in, in a minute, but, um, when William was in, um, Virginia, let me make sure that's right. When he was in Virginia, he met Addie Hunt or Addie Waits's father, who was actually a well-to-do businessman. And, um, which, which again, you know, in the South being black, but, but, but he was a well-to-do businessman and he, he really, Addie was well-educated. Her parents were well-educated. They believed in the value of a good education as did William. Um, Williams, all of William's brothers and sisters, and there were nine of them, very, you know, the, the, the value of an education was really driven home to them. So Addie's father introduced them. So it was Addie and William and they got married. And Addie Hunton um, was quite a writer. 
Um, she wrote a couple books, one of them about her husband, and, and um, she wrote a lot of magazine articles, a lot of journal articles, and she was just the classic kind of community organizer. Um, she, she really believed in the written word, particularly for Black people, because that, you know, there, there, was, there was not a lot written down because Black people were slaves, they were kept illiterate. So she realized anything she could get in writing about what's going on, she, she wanted to do. And what this is, this particular um, picture was you, um, Addie in 1917, her husband died. He, he died in his fifties, he was relatively young. She had an 18 year old um, daughter, Eunice and a 15 year old son. And, you know, it was World War I. She, and there was a lot written about Black people, you know, they're discriminated against so, you know, horribly in the United States, should they serve their country? This was just was a, a debate. And um, a lot of them believe, yes, we, we still should be patriotic. So um, the, the troops that were, the Black troops that were sent overseas, of course, were segregated in their own units. And, and uh, Addie and two other women under the auspices of the YMCA were sent over there just to help them, you know, to give them moral support, to, you know, maybe, you know, provide some education, anything they could do to help these troops. And that's what she, that's what she's doing there. What's interesting, I read her book about serving there. And what was fascinating to me is she essentially said the French were, were very kind to the black soldiers. I mean, they, for the most part, they had no problem with them. It was the American military who really segregated them in France, they would put signs up, you know, black people can go in this cafe. This was in France, but the American military put those signs up. And she said, I mean, she was not, she was kind of like, like um, William, it wasn't like she complained about her, or said this is terrible. She just, it was almost a sadness, like these, these guys are serving their country, you know, and, and this is how they're treated. But, but the book was really, and she wrote the book, outlining it was in great detail it was it was really an interesting book if you have any interest in that topic it, she's the one to um you know that you want to read it um so along comes um that <laughs> the protagonist Eunice <laughs> um Eunice again had parents who were who really thought the, you know, knew the value of a good education. Eunice I think knew a, a couple of languages by the time she went to college she went to Smith college, once again, you, you just think about it, how many black people were at Smith College, you know, in 1920, 1921, the answer is not many. She graduated from Smith with a double, actually, she graduated with a bachelor's and a master's degree the same year she was an overachiever. It was in social work and um, political science. That's her, her picture. I, I really like that picture uh, from the yearbook. And so she becomes a social worker for a few years, gets married to a dentist who lived in Harlem. They moved to Harlem. And she really became part of the Harlem arts scene. If, you're in, if you know anything about the Harlem Renaissance, it's really was a tremendous arts movement. Um, and she became very active in that, knew everybody in the Harlem community. Her husband was a popular dentist in Harlem. She has a baby. And when the baby is, I don't know, eight or nine years old, she decides maybe a little younger. She decides to go to law school. She goes to Fordham University Law School. Um, she was not, well, I, I don't think she was one the first black woman graduate there. That's debatable, but she was certainly one of the first black women graduates of, of Fordham. Um, she, then that's when she becomes a lawyer and there she is kind of, that's that picture of her on the left. That's, she was youngish then. I think that was kind of shortly after she graduated. She graduated in 1932. So she was like 33 years old, roughly when she graduated. That's her a little bit older, you can tell on the right. And so she um, starts working in private practice and she's working a couple of years when there's this um, terrible, terrible riot in, in Harlem and, um, it, it was, it, at that point, it was the worst riot in, in the history of the city. There, there had not been that many, it was 1935. And so after it was over, um, the mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia said, we need to, 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 her, to Herman what caused this riot. And so he uh, appointed a commission of 11 people, black people, white people. And because she was an attorney and, you know, she was a, a black attorney and there weren't many of them, she was on the commission. He appointed her secretary, which meant she gathered all the information. She was really like, like the director of a movie. She was pretty much in charge of gathering everything. 
And she did a phenomenal job. Um, she, they determined that it was economic inequality, education inequality, housing inequality that was in, directly or indirectly responsible, which now, you know, in 2000, you know, this 21st century, it's, you kind of say, well, duh. But, but back then it was, it was quite a revelation. Um, she actually went to the state capitol, lobbied for some housing bills and got them passed. So this, she, she was like, went way beyond the call of duty in, in her jobs. And so what happens, and this is where it gets interesting, um, Tom Dewey is appointed a special prosecutor to get the mob. Tom Dewey says, I want to appoint 20 of the best attorneys in the city of New York. I don't care who they are, <laughs> what religion they are, what color they are. I want the best. And then he appoints, lo and behold, um, Eunice. Cotton Carter, and that's, you can see, um, that the, the Amsterdam News, if, if you don't know, it's still around, it's, it's, it's a black uh, newspaper, but, but this, this one made, I, I don't know if it made all the, the front page of all the newspapers in New York. It was quite a story though, that, that you know, a black woman would be appointed to this particular um, commission to get them off. So Ewan will tell you more about this crazy trial. And the investigation. <laughs> yes. So, um, so before before Eunice joined Dewey's Dewey's team, she had worked at the city's women's court for a while, and she while she was there, she worked on a lot of prostitution cases, and something and she, there's something suspicious that she noticed that um, a lot of the prostitutes who were brought into her office, they all had the same attorney and they all had the same people who bailed them out so Eunice she was thinking you know there's something going on here and she she kind of suspected that the mob has something to do with the prostitution uh, in the city um, and actually a lot of the prostitutes um, back then they managed to get out of trouble just because of their uh, able lawyer and legal representation and when, and Eunice brought her theory to Dewey. Um, Dewey at first was very hesitant to, you know, prostitution, prostitution was never something he wanted to touch, you know, it, because he made a big deal about um, how prevalent organized crime was back then in the city. And prostitution was not a, as a prevalent issue as, you know, jacked up gasoline prices, you know? So he didn't want to deal with that. Um, and he didn't want it to, you know, turn into a morality issue about the sex industry. So, but um, uh, Eunice did more investigation and she found that, you know, the sex industry in the city, it already had a very established structure where the mob would recruit girls from small towns and they would assign them to different bookers and the bookers would place them in different houses. And the key is, so the prostitutes, they would pay the mob a very high fee out of their salary. And the fee was to, was actually sort of as a guarantee that no, none of them would go to jail. So that kind of explained how um, all of them all had the same lawyer, you know, same people bail them out. So they pay a really high fee so that they would be bailed out if they were arrested. And, 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 you know, at this point, the evidence was just too strong for Dewey to ignore. And they looked more into it. They did a lot of wiretapping and telling of a lot of the bookers. Um, and Dewey, they actually, they, his team, his, his team estimated that um, there were about 2,000 prostitutes employed in 200 houses throughout New York City across five bureaus. And Dewey thought they needed to arrest as many people as possible. And they had to do it all at once because you know, if they were to raid some houses sporadically, you know, the mob would catch wind of it, they would just disappear. So they did this very massive um, ra secret raids. So they, Dewey assembled more than 100 police officers 
and they raid 80 houses of prostitution all at once during one night and under secret orders. And they ended up arresting more than 100 prostitutes and most of whom actually served as witness um, at the trial. And Eunice was actually also very helpful in um, extracting evidence and useful information from those prostitutes because there were a lot of you know guys, uh, male investigators on Dewey's team, and they were also very they were very tough. They were very they had a very um, threatening attitude towards those girls and some of them, you know, they wouldn't even approach them or come close to them without wearing gloves. And a lot of those prostitutes, they had drug issues and they were just really intimidated by them and they wouldn't tell the truth. They would just wouldn't speak up at all. And it was, Eunice was really, uh, Eunice approached them with, you know, a gentle, more feminine, sensitive manner and which helped open them up and and, and she really convinced them to tell their truth, tell their stories. And by telling their truth, they can actually um, have a chance in taking down this big mob boss. And so, and the trial later began and um, the, the press actually covered the trial very um, extensively. You know, it was totally sensationalized pages of pages of coverage in any publication. And, you know, reporters, they wrote stories, very colorful stories about Luciano's extravagant lifestyle, how he had a hotel room in the Waldorf Astoria for $100,000 a year. Uh, and they had a lot of, you know, backstory on those prostitutes. And one of them is Florence Brown, AKA Koki Flo. He, she, um, she was a very uh, important witness for the prostitution, prosecution. And she, there was a rumor that she was uh, a lover of Luciano and she actually made a very uh, pivotal testimony against him. Um, she said that she hear Luciano say once that he wanted to make prostitution, he, he wanted to run them on a very large scale, just like a chain store. So she made a very um, powerful testimony that linked Luciano directly to this vice reign. Um, eventually, do, uh, Luciano and nine other co-defendants were found guilty of compulsory prostitution. And Luciano was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in jail. So you, you can see, you know, all the, this is daily news front page, um, just very, uh, a lot of photos. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that this, um, this Luciano prosecution really skyrocketed Dewey's political career and he became an overnight sensation. He became a hero. He became the most, one of the most loved politicians back then. And he went on to have this very impressive career, including, you know, three terms of New York governor. And um, he was a two time Republican nominee for the president. And he, um, if you can go to the next page. Yeah, yeah so this is the, <laughs> this is the one of the most famous history, piece of history and journalism history. Uh, this is Harry Truman, who's holding uh, the front page of Chicago Daily Tribune, Dewey beats Truman, just showing you, you know, how Truman's victory was a huge upset. Even the newspaper got it wrong. Um, and one of the little known fact, a little plot twist, a big plot twist was actually uh, that Luciano, so he was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in jail and guess how many years he ended up serving. He only served 10 years. Um, and in 1946, 
uh, Luciano's attorney actually filed for a commutation for his sentence because, and he, he later reached a deal with the U.S. government to, uh, during the World War II, uh, to help uh, the Navy. And Luciano allegedly provided the U.S. military with uh, very key mafia contacts, and that's how he got out of jail. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about Yuna's career after the prosecution? Yeah. 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 One thing, and and um, just to add to that, um, Lucky Luciano. Then he was deported to Italy. So he got out of jail, <laughs> serving ten years. Was deported to Italy. Um, always wanted to come back to the United States, so they wouldn't let him. But he ended up at the very end coming back to the United States, and we're going <laughs> to we're leaving that to the end. You might say to yourself, well. He, he was deported. They didn't want him back. How did he come back? Well, he did come back, but we'll get to that <laughs> in, a, in a couple minutes. Um, yeah, so so Eunice and Dewey were, were good friends. So Eunice helped. Um, Eunice really helped Dewey in his campaigns for every single campaign. Eunice was a lifelong Republican, um, which was interesting because, you know, we probably all know, you know, um, the party of Lincoln, that's what the Republicans, you know, were called. So, so Blacks, for much of you know, the last, I don't know, 100 years or more, they were Republicans, but they started turning turning in, in more to the Democratic Party when Roosevelt, when FDR became president. So so that was, you know, just an interesting, they, they and there were other reasons that they left, that many Black people left the Republican Party. Eunice never did. She, she was just um, a lifelong Republican. She was very loyal to Thomas Dewey. She, um, worked in the prosecutor's office for 10 years, went into private practice. One thing she did in, in the last, like she died when she was 71 in, in 1970, but she spent the last probably 15 years of her life doing a lot of, um, you know, well, her mother actually was a, a suffrage, worked in suffrage. Eunice was, um, you know, young at that time and didn't, was too young to do that. But she worked in a lot of social causes. She was named a legal advisor to the United Nations when the United Nations was being formed, at, uh, I believe it was 1946 in San Francisco. Um, and that was, if you read a bio, a quick bio of Eunice, they will always mention that she was a legal advisor to the United Nations. Um, she also, I don't wanna say she was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, but she knew Eleanor Roosevelt. If you know anything about that time, of, you know, the, the, the Roosevelt administration, he had what was, I don't know if it was formally or informally called the black cabinet. He was, he appointed, uh, appointed a lot of black people either officially or unofficially, they also served as advisors to him. And one, one of these people, her name was Mary McLeod Bethune. She was, I guess, known as an educator, but, but she was a good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. So you can imagine that gave her a lot of, a lot of clout. And Eunice was a good friend of Mary McLeod Bethune. So that was the link to Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so, you know, Eunice was was steadfastly loyal to Thomas Dewey. There are some people that say Dewey could have appointed her to a judgeship, but he never did. I mean, there, there's just, you know, well, did Dewey treat her well? Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, but you know, Eunice was her own woman. And I don't think just in our research about her, I don't think she would have been as loyal to him for decades if, if you know, she felt that, that he had not treated her right. Um, one thing that she was very proud of, her son Lyle Jr. Um, became an attorney, um, and and you know that you know she talked about him a lot in interviews. The thing about that, and this go, the book goes into this more. Lyle was sent to Barbados during the trial and during a lot of um, Eunice's work with the mob. Her, her his father was from Barbados. Eunice's husband was from Barbados. And um, Eunice said in interviews, they just felt that he wasn't safe with, you know, the work she was doing with the mob. And they, they were brutal. I mean, they put out, a couple of people put out a hit on um, Dewey. You know, they weren't afraid to do that. And it never, so anyway, but that was one of her, you know, crowning accomplishments, which was her one son. Um, a couple other things just before we, we, we I tell you how, Lucky Luciano got back in the United States. Um, 
there, there was one thing I think is really important and you might be able to speak to this. There were some very questionable legal tactics that Tom Dewey used to get a, um, pro, you know, to, to prosecute the mob, to be successful. One of them was he appointed what was called the blue ribbon ju a jury, you know, in jury selection. What's a blue ribbon jury? It's a, a jury of people, only people who have served on juries before. All right, so you couldn't be on this jury if you didn't serve on a jury before. Well, who served on the jury before? Well, wealthy people, white people. Um, so it was really, you know, that it, jury, you know, that that became illegal. I, I don't know when, but it was. It, it is not. It is not legal now. But the jury packing, you know, the jury was all white guys. Um, there were problems with that. There were problems with wiretap, and you you might be able to speak to this, didn't they? They they just were tapping phones, but they really didn't get any kind of permission to to conduct. Yeah, wiretaps. I wanted to add one thing about the blue ribbon jury. So the Dewey's team actually reached out to uh, a lot of many top businessmen in New York, and a lot of you know executive on Wall Street, including the president of Goldman Sachs. He actually reached out to him saying, "Hey, are you willing to serve on this jury?" Uh, just to show you, you know, how what kind of people they were going after. Um, yeah, they also used a tactic of wiretapping, uh, which later on became controversial because they didn't have the permit to, to do that. Um, and, and it was a very important part of uh, the trial because they really gathered information from, they, because they wiretapped a lot of the bookers, key bookers back then. And it revealed the relationship between the booker and the mob's attorney, and you know, prostitutes. So it's uh, yeah, he used uh, some you know questionable <laughs> tactics during the investigation for sure. And so the final point about how lucky Luciano, who really wanted to get back <laughs> to the United States after he was deported, how how did he get back? Well. I guess he, he, he got back apparently in a coffin because he had in his will, I want to be buried in the United States, specifically in St. John Cemetery in Queens, New York, which is, is nearby. Nick Hershon lives near that cemetery. <laughs> um, but he, he, a lot of mobsters are buried there. And that was, I guess, the US government said, all right, we'll let you back in the United States as long as you're dead. So they put him back and, you know, they, they got him back in St. John's. And there's one thing, I don't know, I found this amusing. Maybe it's, you know, <laughs> it's not that funny. But where he was buried was like four or five rows down from another mobster who Luciano put a hit on. So back in the day when Luciano was just an up and coming mobster, he put a hit on his boss, all right, which you do, I guess, <laughs> you know, when, when you're in the mob. And this boss was buried in St. John's and in near Lucky Lucky Luciano. So I like that final bit of irony at, at the end of, of the whole story. <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, as Dr. Greenwald <laughs> mentioned, I live very nearby St. John's Cemetery. <laughs> and I was telling her that I vividly remember over the years, different mobsters having their funerals there, including <laughs> most famously John Gotti. Um, so uh, yes, so that, uh, you know, but thank you so much for Dr. Greenwald Newton for uh, introducing us to this topic for going through that whole presentation. Um, I, you know, very proud as an OU person, I was wearing my green and white OU colors today um, for, <laughs> for you guys uh, and really appreciate, uh, you know, all of this hard work you've done. So I know we're going to get to a lot of questions that folks here might have. Uh, but first, we, for everybody, there's some students in, you know, the room with us today, but also just for anybody who's here, we are going to do something a little bit fun, a little bit different. Um, so for right now, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to play a quiz to see how closely you paid attention to everything that they were just saying. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kahoot, but this interactive quiz game. So if you have your phone or if you would want to just open another tab in your computer, and I'll just give everybody a minute to do this. You see, you join at a website, www.kahoot.it. So if you just put that in the URL browser in your phone, um, or you know, if you have the app, uh, you can do this right now. Just, and then you'd be prompted to insert this game pin that is up there at the top of the screen. 
584-8349. All right, so we'll give you all a minute to get in here and I can play Kahoot has this, uh, there's Jay, one of our students at William Patterson. Um, Kahoot has this fun, jaunty music usually. I don't know how well you can hear that. Um, Matt, but, Matt, by the way, I want to interrupt, is one of my former students at OU. And Matt, you better do well on this. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you're, you've been uh, noticed. You've been served. Um, so I see we have a few people here. Uh, Matt wrote in the chat, he cannot guarantee it, but I'm sure he's going to try. <laughs> um, so waiting for everybody, Snoop Dug. <laughs> there we go, Doug Bannon. So we have, I think, three, uh, four people right now so far. Anybody else trying to get in? I'll leave this open again. If you just go to the URL uh, on your, your browser window in your phone, www.kahoot.it. We're playing here, folks, for a free copy of Eunice Hutton Carter. A like free autograph copy from both of them. See, mine isn't even autographed. I bought this one from Amazon, like a sucker. I went to Fordham <laughs> University Press site because they were having a discount. And I got it and I opened it up all excited. Not any ink inside except for the words that they wrote. So I don't even well, get their signature. You know, but, <laughs> but you could have a different fate. Don't make my mistake. Um, go to kahoot.it right now. And a limited time offer. We can't do this all day. <laughs> Um, so we will see anyone else trying to get in before we start our game here. Final uh, choice. Yoon, you, you're going to try to join and see how you can compete or no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we're ready, we can start playing along. All right, so here you are in the quiz. Eunice Sutton Carter, A Lifelong Fight for Social Justice. You're gonna have 30 seconds each to answer these questions. There are five of them. Which official appointed Eunice Carter to a commission exploring the Harlem riot of 1935? They just talked about it. So was this official President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, New York Governor Herbert Lehman, New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, or New York Governor Mario Cuomo? <laughs> You see there a New York Daily <laughs> News cover. I used to be a reporter for the Daily News. Actually, I know that uh, Yoon was talking before as they were showing the cover of the Daily News. And my first job was actually as an intern at the New York Amsterdam News that they were also talking about. But so we only have one person who got that correct right now, uh, Mayor Fiorel LaGuardia. The other three weren't paying attention. Uh -oh. um, so You know, maybe, my, maybe the students would complain that my quizzes were too hard and I just thought they, you know, I didn't believe it. Maybe I should have believed them. Right? <laughs> uh, well, we're going to see who ended up as <laughs> our, who's our leader right now. It is after all of that, JCH. Congratulations to, I'm not sure who JCH is right now, but <laughs> congratulations to JCH <laughs> for being the only one to get that correct. We expect better from the rest of you on this next one. Okay. How many witnesses testified against Lucky Luciano in the trial? And there we have a great glamour shot of Lucky. Um, more than 100, more than 500, only 50 or only 20. So what do we think here? How many witnesses do they get to testify? That was a quick one. And again, only one person gets this correct that it was more uh -oh. than 100. We're gonna see is JCH still showing up everybody here? Um, no, now we have Doug on the board. So now we have a race, folks. It's like calling the Kentucky Derby. As he looks, as he appears on camera, because he is cheating, cheating, everybody. He's a, <laughs> look, at, he is reading the book as he is answering these questions, looking this up in the index, assuredly. Um, well, that is just against the spirit of everything that Thomas Dewey stood for. Uh, okay, so now we have a tight race. The third question. When Lucky Luciano was arrested by Dewey's team, how much did the judge set the bailout in today's dollars? Was it $100 million, $40 million, $1 million, or $20 million? I intentionally Two. left that out during my presentation. Oh, so take oh. a wild guess. <laughs> how many do you think? Well, three of our four people have answered. Wow. Ooh. We really split yes. the, uh, the jury here. So one person got 20 minutes. I would love to see if this is someone new and then we have like a three-way race now. Oh, but it is JCH um. taking a commanding lead. <laughs> Doug and Jay and Matt still trying to get their first correct answer. Um, well, we have two more chances. 
Luciano was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison for compulsory prostitution. How many years did he eventually serve? I know I just heard them talk about this. So was it 30 years, 50 years, 10 years, or 40 years? See him smiling there. How many years did that smiling man have to serve? He's smiling. I don't think it was 50 years, but I don't know. Are we listening to this? Did you all flip through your indexes madly? Well, okay. <laughs> Everybody now, got that you one. You all right? knew that one. Good. It was 10 years. So now we are going to have a little bit more evenness maybe here. Um, so everybody goes up. So we have someone new joining. Um, oh, so we have JCH in the lead. Doug is still reading the book, getting all of his answers. I see on camera. Um, Jay and Matt are now on the board. Congratulations. Um, so we're going to see in this last question. I think actually Doug is now the only because the each one is worth a thousand points depending on how fast you answer. So if JCH gets this next one wrong and Snoop Dogg gets it right, very quickly gets it right, then he could win, uh, I guess, another copy of the book so he can cheat at the next Kahoot quiz that we'll do. <laughs> He'll be able to have two copies at his disposal <laughs> next time. So let's see. We're on our fifth and final question here. Eunice Carter worked for which international agency that was formed after the end of World War II to prevent future world wars? Was it the League of Nations, the United Nations, the Interagency Council, or the Confederacy of Countries? What do you think? All of those world flags there. We already have four answers. I think we're waiting for, I think we had a fifth competitor now. So people are now knowing that it's it's based on how fast you answer. Not only correct, but if you answer quicker, you get more points for the correct answer. So now that everyone knew that, they're immediately pressing the button. Um, one second left. And it was the United Nations. Um, so now they're going to tell us our final podium here. They're going to have a bronze, silver, and gold. So we're going to see who paid attention. Congratulations. In third place, we have Snoop Dogg. That's a little bit of a surprise because in the he was running second. We have Jay from Jay Wilson, who is one of my students at William Patterson. Congratulations, Jay, for paying attention. And in first place is JCH. Um, runners up were Matt and Beth. So thank you to everybody who, uh, who joined us. I'm going to adjust the volume because I know this elevator music. Um, if you're an educator, we've all been using Kahoot a lot lately, and it starts to get uh, old after a while. Um, but uh, yes, and Matt is saying in the chat, he's happy he is not last. Oh, JCH is was my is my aunt. <laughs> Sorry, is, oh, is Janice. Oh, wait a minute. It's a minute uh, called after it's after I was saying to Doug house. that he and now it's my own <laughs> aunt. Weird. Are you related to Thomas beginning. Dewey? <laughs> um, and 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 Jay asked in the chat if they can get a half signed copy of half of the book for second place. <laughs> so we will have to see. We. The only even thing, only the book's true owner would say that. So we, we will not <laughs> chop the book in half. Um, the publisher do, already did that. So anyway. We will lead it, leave it to the <laughs> yeah, authors cut, to, cut it. to figure that out. Um, so congratulations to my aunt, Janice. <laughs> um, and I know now we're going to have uh, a chance for questions and answers. So if you're new to Zoom, you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, the reactions button, it looks like a little smiley face of a plus and you should be able to click a stop hand. It looks like that. It's a raise hand actually. So you can click it and I will see who you are. I can kind of serve as a moderator here and call whoever has a question. Or if you want to just put a question in the chat or say in the chat, you know, hey, I'd like to speak next. Um, or I guess we're all friends here and maybe we can even do it in undemocratic, just come on mic um, and you can ask a question. Um, but is there anybody who would like to ask a question of the authors? I see that Charlotte has raised her hand. So Charlotte, you can unmute and then we'll hear you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, my name's Charlotte. I'm actually a coworker of Yoon's at CNBC. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Yoon. Uh, this is great. Thanks um, for joining. <laughs> I actually had a question naturally as a fellow journalist. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your writing process and you know where you, you, how you went about finding all the research and, and conducting uh, the research for the book. Great, thank you so Ooh. much for your question. Um, it actually took us, um, I would say a couple of years, four years to finish the whole project. And 
we went to different archives um, for you know primary sources, primary information. Um, so specifically me, I went to the University of Rochester where Thomas Dewey's papers are housed, which I still don't know why his papers are housed there. What's the connection there? I don't think the archivist told me either. She didn't know. Um, but uh, there was a lot of um, oral history information, um, not only from Dewey, but other investigators on his team, so which was very helpful. And um, also a lot of, you can see a lot of correspondence between Dewey and Eunice Carter. And that told me, told us, you know, the relationship between them. Um, and I also went to, I spent a lot of my weekends <laughs> in uh, the New York City Municipal Archives where um, they had the uh, Luciano trial records. So a lot of trial transcripts, a lot of um, just court records and, you know, a lot of, um, so they have, you know, all the transcripts, you know, every sentence, every word they ever said on the court. So that was very helpful too, because, you know, there's a chapter in the book uh, about the trial and I included a lot of, you know, very colorful and fascinating scene from the trial, which we, you can read all about it in the book. Um, yeah, do you want to talk about the writing process as well, Dr. Yunhua? Yeah, I'll get real quick because I'll talk about the other archives because this is what made the book, I think, because we got these archives. You know, you can, it's hard to do a book like this without primary sources, and by that we mean letters and things like that. Um, yeah, there was um, at, at Howard, Howard University, the library there um, had the letters of William, her father, when he was, you know, in the South. And there, there were many of those. Those were really illuminating. Um, I used some information from the University of Minnesota, which houses the YMCA archives. Didn't go there, but there was a lot online. And anybody who wants to be a researcher, there's just so much online now. Back in the day, you had to travel. You, you, you had to travel no matter what you did. Now, if you're lucky, you can get a lot of stuff online. Um, and then I, you know, a couple other places, but I went to Chatham, Ontario, where, his, you know, Stan Hutton, you know, where he escaped to essentially. Um, really a, a fascinating little community. They have a museum there about their history. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, I don't know what to say really, Yoon, about the writing because it's it's so kind of smushy, isn't it? I mean, we you, we both did a couple papers together by papers for academic conferences. So we, we had our little head start, but we just, I, I don't know, we, we kind of like divided the book into different sections and I did some, she did some, and, and, and it was natural in some ways because since she was in, in, in New York doing a lot of the New York end of it, she did a lot of the stuff on the trial in the New York end. And, you know, I, I had gone to Washington to Howard University. So I did a lot on, on Eunice's, you know, parents and her early life. So it, in some ways I think it fell into place, but it was, it took, don't you think it yeah. took kind of a lot of talking to determine who was gonna do what? Right, yeah. and I think one of the biggest challenges for me is that just given the sheer amount of all the sources, all the documents that we got, and just how to organize everything, and you know, really, yeah, put into words, and yeah, that was really hard. Um, just one thing, I also went through a ton of newspapers, you know, back then, just to see, you know, what the coverage was like. A lot of going through a lot of microfilm, a lot of you know, archives and just newspaper clippings. And that was very, very helpful as well. Yeah. You know, I think I, I never asked you this, but you probably agree. We, and this is, I, I've had this with other books I've written. You use about five, five to 10% of what you have. I yeah, mean, most, and Nick knows this too. Most of, you get so much stuff that if you used most of it, your book would be like 38 volumes. I mean, you, you just use such a small, it's heartbreaking, you know, and I mean, not that you would use it all, but it's heartbreaking the, <laughs> the small amount that you use. It's, you know, what, what do we say? Like, kill your babies. I mean, there's so much you can't use and you think, oh, this is awful. I can't use this, but, you know, so. Well, thank you. And thank you, uh, Charlotte, for the question. Um, I see that we have a second question from Jay Wilson, who is the outgoing secretary of our award-winning William Patterson <laughs> Society Professional Journalist chapter, who is, uh, yes, is uh, raise, raising their hand. So yes, Jay, you want to come on? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I actually did find, I know you're just talking about it, but I found the idea of, of the trial, of the process of taking down, you know, this big personality really interesting because uh, I briefly sort of wanted to be a lawyer for a while. And so I studied, um, you know, law stuff. And I, I was in a mock trial, I remember, in high school. Um, and I remember... Uh, that whole process uh, really well of, you know, you get so invested in, in the character of like this one, uh, you know, person who's not even an actual like, you know, uh, defendant, they're just playing a defendant. Um, but that personality is so big and so important and so interesting to the trial. Um, and then I'm thinking of in this case, you know, you talked a little bit about it, but like you have these larger than life super wealthy, you know, people with these super expensive suits and their, you know, funny nicknames that we now know them for and all this stuff. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm really curious about the process of writing that, of uh, digging past maybe some of these, uh, you know, ideas and, and getting to the heart of that process and how difficult that must have been. Um, I think it is a it is a very good question. And actually for Lucky Luciano, you know, even though he was very well known by the time of the trial, but before, before the investigation, he was actually kept, he was able to kept a pretty low profile. And it was Thomas Dewey who, who really manipulated the press and turned Luciano into a household name. You know, he, Dewey described him as the public enemy number one, you know, just like the vicious, like the, the mob lord, you know, and I think writing about it, the journalist in me really wanted to, you know, of course, you know, to tell the truth. And I really um, looked at the newspaper's coverage, you know, how the media portrayed him and they wrote a lot of stories about, like I said, about his lifestyle, you know, how extravagant it was. And a lot about how he dressed, his fancy suit. And, um, and I think also just through how intimidating, intimidated a lot of the witnesses, a lot of prosecutors uh, were um, sent on the stand, you know, testify against him. You can tell, you know, how big of a um, powerful and figure that Luciano really was. Um, do you want to add anything, Dr. Bingo? Yeah, I mean, and you you touched on this, but I think you know, just to drive it home a little bit, mm -hmm. Luciano was not a household name by any stretch of the imagination when this thing started. I mean, they knew him within the mob, but he wasn't, and that was part of. Dewey's strategy. We we got we can't just say, oh, the mob, they're all these people and they're terrible. You've got to have a figurehead. You know, this is how he was really brilliant at public relations, you know. You got to have a figurehead. And here was Lucky, you know, with his expensive, I mean he and he was, I mean, he definitely was on top of, of the hierarchy, but nobody, nobody outside of the mob knew who he was. He was kind of handsome. I mean, you saw his pictures, he had kind of the craggy face and he had scars, but he was a handsome guy. So, you know, he was like the perfect foil, you know, like this, this is the guy who was the symbol of the mob and Dewey just used, used that, used that. Interesting question though, because I, I, you know, I guess as an attorney, what do you do with a, with, with a colorful, you know, you, you want to convict someone who's really colorful, you know, who people kind of like, what, what do you do, you know? Oh, thank you again for the question, Jay, and for the answers. Uh, I see we have another question here from Doug Daniels. I'm going to ask him to unmute and he can ask. And again, anybody else who wants to just click raise hand or put something in the chat and we can form a queue and I'll make sure I'll call on you in that order. But yes, Doug, if you want to unmute. And Hi, can you question. hear me all right? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, you know, it struck me when Marilyn was talking about how she got the idea, how much that is so like a journalist to be at a museum and be thinking about things and asking a question and wondering what the answer would be. Where did this person come from? And I wonder if both authors can talk about how their journalism experience slash education helped them 
come up, not just come up with the idea for this book, but helps them when they do their research and their writing? Good question. Um, <laughs> uh, well, go go ahead, Yoon. Because no, you go. No, I'll, I'll, well, I'll take a second. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because you might think, well, you know, we, we're you know, we're both in journalism. You know, Yoon and I are both in journalism. We, we're, we're in a journalism school, and you might say, well, okay, but why, you know, somebody writing about Yunus and the mob that doesn't really, at first glance, see that it would be journalism. But it, but it is just because, you know, to me, it's digging up the information, you know, no, know, you know, knowing where to find it or knowing, well, in our case, and Doug is a good friend of mine and also is a Bobcat graduated from OU and taught at OU. And we've had many conversations about this. We're, we're good friends. And we say, you know, you've got to have the raw material. Um, and that's not to put down writing. You've, you've got to write, we've got to do it. And, and you know, you want to be a good writer, but if you, if you don't have the material there, you, you know, it, it's just not going to work. You could be the best writer in the world. So it's, it's the raw material, knowing where to find it. Um, you know, then there's issues of copyright, which I won't even get into. That's a whole Zoom session on its own, but, but you have to know legally what you can use and what you can't use. So I guess the quick answer to me is that the journalism training got me knowing a little bit how to dig. You know, I mean, I think the person who lives four doors down from me, I don't know if they would know, you know, I, I need to know how to dig and get this information that, that, that isn't really, you know, commonly available. Yeah, I think writing about history, writing a biography, although it's different, very different than what I do now, business reporting, but it's essentially journalism. You're trying to gather information and to tell the truth. And especially for me, because of, because how Dewey was able to cultivate a lot of really uh, cultivate his relationship with all of the editors and reporters. So it's really important for me to make the judgment, is the coverage accurate back then? You know, how much can I trust this coverage? And, you know, obviously they were in favor of Dewey. They were rooting for him. So, and so that I think it's very important to tell that side of the story as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a, it's a very, it's a learning experience for me. You know, I would never have imagined I can, you know, co-author a book. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think the journalism training really helped a lot just doing, just in terms of doing research and using your best judgment. Yeah. If, if I might ask a follow-up question, it's probably more directed at you. And uh, one of the things I've always found in bouncing back and forth as I've done, as you've done, in being a journalist who's supposed to look at both sides, all sides of something, and try to maintain some degree of independence and not favor one side over the other. While I think when you're writing a book as a historian, you are supposed to make judgments. You are supposed to come to conclusions which we really try not to do as journalists as far as you know who might be telling the truth or not be or uh, making a judgment that this was a mistake and so on so i've always found that to be the big jump over the fence in writing a book as a historian that you suddenly are free of these shackles that journalists rightfully have on them and I wondered if you found that to be something different in your experience. Um, I think I, I didn't necessarily made a lot of opinions about Dewey, but I, I get what you're saying. And a lot of aspects of it, you know, just like Dewey's questionable tactic using wiretaps, using the Blue Ribbon Jury. I think it's important to bring that in light as well, not just telling one side of the story, you know, how successful of a prosecutor he was. Um, and, you know, he, he, was a, he was a Republican and we also told, you know, his uh, history and his complicated relationship with his family, with his wife and his kid. So um, I think for me as a writer, I wasn't too comfortable making statements about those characters, those people. And I was just telling the story from what I gathered 
and um, and you know, readers can make their own judgment about what they think about it, just from you know, the <laughs> the things that I the information that I had in the book. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Dr. Greenwald? No, but I mean that yeah. And Doug, your question's good. You know, that, is there a difference between writing history and writing journalism and you know, there is and there is and there isn't. Yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough question. And, you know, I used to teach a class in biography writing and we talked about that, like how much of, of a license do you have as writing a, a, a biography to say, well, she was upset about this. Well, I don't, you know, you don't have any solid evidence she was upset. So how can you say she was upset? Well, your, your knowledge of the person and the person's background would lead you to believe that she was upset. You know, so whereas if you're a journalist, you can't really say she's upset unless you either see her crying or somebody close to her says she was crying. You know, so so there's shades of, of differences and, and it's a lot of judgment, you know. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Doug, for the question. We have a queue now forming. We have three people um, who are now are trying to ask questions. So next up we have Elizabeth Graham. And I don't know if Elizabeth, if you're able to come on mic and if you want to read your question, otherwise I can read it for you, but see if you give you a second there. Uh, initially, the, there was the thought that there wasn't enough material on Eunice and um, something changed and I must have missed it or, or perhaps you didn't elaborate on it, but somehow all of a sudden there is this voluminous <laughs> amount of material. It just appeared, Beth. Yeah. <laughs> Did I, did I miss something or? Yeah, no, um, actually, and before Beth is another Bobcat taught it yep. for many years and is, is, was the director of a department at Kent State. So um, no, and we glossed over that because uh, it's to be honest. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I felt that Eunice's role in the, in the mob, there wasn't enough there. You know, might've made a long magazine article. We didn't, there, Eunice didn't have any papers. I don't, we don't have any letters from her. At this point, we didn't know who her family was. And even if we did, you know, who's to say someone's got an interesting family? You know, I mean, we could have, you know, well, you know, I have no reason to believe she has an interesting family. And then as we were pulling the threads, well, okay, I do see a book by her mother, which ended up, you know, saying how she went to, you know, World War One and helped the troops. Then I saw something else and saw that she had a grandfather who was a, you know, formerly a slave. And so, um, once we we thought said there's more to Eunice than this mob trial, like bits and pieces we were pulling threads. And by the time we determined what her father did and what her mother did and what her grandfather did we're like, yeah, this is, yeah, this is more than just a long magazine article. But no, that's a good question. We did, we did kind, of, kind of gloss over that. <laughs> yeah, we also found out that Eunice actually was, after the trial, he, she actually served as um, kind of an advisor to Dewey when he ran for uh, governor of New York. So she really uh, taught him how to appeal to black voters, um, which, played a very important role in securing the government position, yeah. Well, and you. almost becoming president. I yeah. mean, he was, he, yeah, he was true. She an inch away, bigger. you know, yeah. If, if, if uh, Dewey had prevailed, oh, yeah. imagine what she would have been. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, you would think that she would be in his cabinet. Yeah. You know? I hope. <laughs> I, you know, one thing, and Thomas Dewey, I think, is a real understudied figure in history. I didn't know much about him. I think he's fascinating. I mean, I 99% I, of what I know about Thomas Dewey, I learned in this project. And I looked up and I said, how on earth was this guy not president? I mean, just everything that he did and he came so close. So he's, I think he's kind of an under, understudied person in history. And thank, and thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. I was just going to say, I feel that... Um, I actually have to admit that I was a doubter early on because I remember Dr. Greenwald and Yoon telling me about this project while I was finishing up my doctoral studies. I guess it was around 2015, 2016 when they were starting to dig into this research. And I thought the same thing. There just doesn't seem to be much out there about these folks. Um, maybe they were interesting, but it's hard to kind of summon every, all these, you know, unless they've left a gigantic archive somewhere, it's just hard to do this research. Uh, but 
credit to them. You never doubt them because they were able to be determined and find it and tell the story of these two really interesting people together. Uh, and there's obviously a trend in biography now about like relationships between people and how they interact. So I thought that's great. I don't want to take too much time from our next question. So I think uh, Matt Burns, you've uh, had your hand up. So thanks for being patient. Matt, your question. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I, I can't help thinking how really well-timed this book is um, when we're having a lot of conversations about how um, American stories are so, you know, whitewashed. Um, and so I was just wondering, and I also, and Dr. Grimo, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think this is your first Black biography subject too, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So I, would, I was wondering if, you know, I, I know that you were very far into the process by a year ago now, but I'm just wondering if how what has been going on in the country over the past year has maybe reshaped or reframed some of your own thinking about your subject and even just the work that you have done in general. Excellent question. And you can tell that Matt also used to be a reporter. <laughs> that was such a good, a good question. Yeah. Um, what's happened in the last year, you know, is amazing as far as, you know, race relations and, and just everything that's, that's been going on. And you know what it's done though? I mean, cause we were so, you know, finished with the, you know, you're finished with the book and I mean, there's things you have to do, but, but we were finished with the book long before, you know, we had the black woman vice president, et cetera. But what it's done is now that we're in the process of trying to publicize the book, which is, you know, uh, that's, as I like to say, it's harder than writing the book um, <laughs> because there's so much out there and getting people interested in it. Um, what, what I've done now, in fact, I think I, I, I actually pitched this to a, an editor at Ms. Magazine Online who, who said she was gonna run it, but we'll see. What I've done is um, Eunice, when she was in her thirties and active in the Harlem Renaissance talked about what it's like to be first, you know, cause she was first this, she was first that. And even in her early 30s, she says, it's really important for marginalized groups, you know, people of color to have role models who are first. That's, you know, maybe if you're white, you don't understand it, but, but it's really important because that's someone you look up to and you say, I can be like that. And she was very eloquent. Eunice should have been a writer. She actually did a lot of writing. I'm, I'm really not doing her any justice by the way I'm paraphrasing her, to be honest, because she was quite eloquent, but she, she said that. And so that's how we're, what we're doing now is we're saying, not only did she, you know, it's the 85th anniversary of this trial, but then we have somebody who was successful back when it was even a black person, when it was even harder to be a role model as a role model and speaking about the value of role models and how, you know, they mean so much to people. And sometimes, you know, we, especially groups that don't have a lot of people to look up to and how much we don't realize that. So, so on one hand, it, it didn't really affect us when we were writing it, but it's definitely affecting us now when we're trying to promote it. And that is a really good question. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, we have next up is Jack Doolin. Um, Jack, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Well, I mean, it, it may be a bit of a, a, a follow on question because, uh, uh, you know, it strikes me, it, it's very interesting that, you know, Thomas Dewey and Lucky Luciano are, of course, these really compelling figures. And I'm just wondering if it was hard for Eunice <laughs> not to get a little lost in, you know, in, in the, uh, flow here. I mean, I, you know, I mean, uh, especially Lucky Luciano is, you know, he's been depicted in movies and big people have played him. And even Thomas Dewey has, you know, Humphrey Bogart played a fictionalized version of him in a, in a film. But also, you know, that in the classic Christmas film, Miracle on 34th Street, the district attorney is said to be based on Thomas Dewey. Mm. The character's name is Thomas Mira, you know, and he's, and he looks, he's got a must, you know, he, he physically resembles him and, and everything. And I was, was this, um, you know, not only in writing the book, well, I imagine not even so much writing the book, but now that you're 
publicizing it. Um, uh, is this is it difficult? To, I mean, is this to to not let her get? Yeah, uh, it's it's a great question. Swamped. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Go ahead. Funny enough, Luciano's name was actually in the original book title, right, Dr. Greenwald? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. we thought of initially. But, you know, we really wanted to make it about Eunice and make it about her biography and her story. Um, and we actually toned down a little bit about the trial about Luciano and Dewey. Um, and only focusing on, you know, how Eunice played a part in that part of the history. Um, yeah, is there anything else? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question because you have these two really colorful flamboyant characters and then you've got somebody, and Eunice was low key. I mean, it's not like, well, she might've been a woman but she was very charismatic. And I'm not saying, charismatic might not be the right word, but you know what I'm saying, and Jack, what you were saying, compared to those two guys, you know, she was soft spoken. She didn't want to be center of attention. So, yeah, and, and we had this added, I guess, problems. Lou, you and allude to that. That um, you know, we we almost have to talk about the trial to get publicity for this in some areas. You mm -hmm. know, we just do. Um, in the eighty fifth anniversary, oh, you know, editors love anniversaries. So, so you, you kind of have to do it, even though you realize that was a eh, small part of her life when you're you know talking about what she did it actually was a small part of her life but i guess you got to make those compromises or or you won't get anything about her you know at least if if we pitch the fact that she she did this trial at least we can talk about the other stuff or write about the other stuff once we get our foot in the door on that but yeah that's that's an excellent question about these these two extremely colorful characters and where does eunice you know low-key eunice fit in you know and how do you deal with it I mean, and a follow-up question. I mean, is is there has there been any sort of interest in anybody, you know, in terms of like dramatizing this for a limited series or film? Well, <laughs> funny you would ask. Well, I we don't know. I mean, the book's been out for a month, so we don't know. But I, I haven't seen Boardwalk Empire. I don't know if people have seen that that show yeah. as well. I was, there, there was, a, I guess, several people have, have told us, and, and it's mentioned in our book, there was a black woman, I don't know if she was a district attorney or an attorney who worked for the government in that series. And a couple people have told us, no, her name wasn't Eunice and she was fictional. But some people have said, I wonder if she's based on Eunice. Now, I haven't seen the series. I don't think she had a major role. It's not like she, she was- She does not have a major role. Okay, the, and you I saw mean, it, okay. Yeah. yeah, so there's that, but but- no, and I mean, I, of course, you and I think this because we've spent years of our lives on this, but, but we think that it would be a good, some, you know, it would be something good to, to dramatize on the screen, you know, so. Well, and as a, as, as a, as a casting director, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, it's, there's a, a wonderful actor. She's not a big name, per se, which is always a problem, but, uh, her name is Linda Powell, and I think mm -hmm. she would be absolutely brilliant. She is, incidentally, the daughter of Colin Powell, and oh. uh, and just an, an, an amazing actor, filled with, with great, very authoritative, and filled with this great kind yeah. of her strength and everything. But, well, I get the impression, obviously, you know, you and I have not met, you know, Eunice, but you you get the impression that she was this quiet, and you, you just kind of said she had quiet authority. You know, the, the, and that's hard. I mean, sometimes when you're quiet, you don't have authority because you're not saying a lot. But I get the impression that she had this quiet authority, which probably stemmed from that she was so competent and good at what she did. I mean, I think she finally, you know, she persuaded people. She was so competent in everything she did, she did well, that she got this quiet authority. So, yeah, that that's how I see her, you know, just studying about her, studying her. Anybody you know, Jack's in theater and has been in New York theater and has been in a long time and knows everybody, by the way. But any, anybody you know is interested, you know, you have my numbers. <laughs> I was just going to say we should like open the bidding. So now we're going to move on to the next portion of tonight the auctioning off of the rights, the movie rights yeah, for right. Lisa Carter. Um, 
You're going to start at $5 million. Uh, <laughs> but yes, no, these are some great questions so far. Um, anyone else? I, I know that um, some folks have been commenting in the chat and what happens is since I'm the host, it sometimes goes just to me and not everybody else can see it in the chat. But I was seeing that Elizabeth said, when will the two of you be on C-SPAN? So do you have any <laughs> update for us? When are you going to have your... Uh, your spotlight uh, when you're going to get your walk on the Hollywood, you know, your uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And but when are you going to be on C-SPAN to discuss this book? Well, this is an idea. We we actually are talking at the Mob Museum by yes. Zoom. Is it June? Is next it June? Month. Yeah, next June second, I think June. Mm -hmm. And that's literally that's two weeks from the actual 85th anniversary of the um, of the verdict. And it is at the Mob Museum, so maybe we can, in Zoom, um, maybe we can get C-SPAN interested in that, I don't know. I, I will tell you, these questions are great though. I, I, if, if we can get questions this good there, I, would, I will be very, extremely happy. Well, you were on C-SPAN before. For the Charlotte Curtis book a long time ago. Oh, so yeah. it's not that big of a stretch. <laughs> well, that's very nice. <laughs> Beth is, an old friend of mine, <laughs> so that's very nice, <laughs> very nice of you. No, so I yeah, think, but yeah. but that's a good idea. I mean, I don't know. I guess you can contact them, you know. So certainly, yeah. And I didn't. Sorry, I Nick. Teasing. I think I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I was just teasing. Obviously, it's oh. not that big a stretch because I know that she was on uh, on C-SPAN before, and every now and then, some of the folks from our media historian group we spot them on C-SPAN. It's really neat to see that. Um, I wonder at the Mob Museum, are you going to get these people like these pro Luciano people? So you wrote this book about this woman who put <laughs> Luciano away. Where do, where do you guys get off writing a book about these prosecutors, the pro mob crowd? Um, but I, I know we had a lot of a very engaged audience. I don't want to cut any conversation off. Is there any other comment or question that anyone would like to make before we uh, wrap up here today? Quick thing, and I, there's a lot of my friends out there, and thank you so much. I mean, and I'm sure you feel the same way because her yeah. friends are there too. I mean, it's it, at least in Ohio, it's a really nice day. It's probably like that in New York and various other places. So, so coming in here to, to do this, we really appreciate it. Um, and just on a personal note, um, Ewan and Nick and I were all at OU at the same time for a couple of years, and we did a really quick run through of this yesterday on Zoom, you know, for like a half hour. And I, I, I gotta admit, I choked up having these two, you know, together again because <laughs> it was it, it was lots of fun when when the three of us were, were together at OU and in classes and stuff, and it just it it you know it makes you realize you know, that you miss people. I, I mean, the Zoom is great, and thank God whoever invented Zoom. It's not the same as as being there, but it was it was nice, and I really appreciate both you guys, and 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 I did get get a little bit choked up yesterday. So. Anyway, all right, to you, Nick. But thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think, and I know you said some of this at the start, and I should have said it more full oh, throat no. at the beginning. But uh, no, but I mean, it, obviously, as we now look back, and I've I graduated OU in 2016 uh, with my PhD, and so you know now it's been five years. It seems crazy to say it, uh, but. Uh, you know, you look back at those great memories we had uh, together in Athens, and it's it's wonderful to be able to see the fruits of your labor. You know, you're a very productive author to see this project come to fruition. And again, that you're collaborating with a, a former student in Yoon, you know, so that it seems like you're always very good at uh, nurturing young authors and raising us up. Um, and that's something that is just, you know, I think lost a lot. You hear about it in the academy. All I've hear, um, I don't know, Yoon's probably heard it too, but in the years since I've graduated OU, I've heard from so many people who've gotten PhDs at other institutions and they talk about, oh, I had this terrible advisor and they wanted to take lead authorship on my project or they would never respond to emails or they never cared. And I just always kind of feel like a little sheepish and saying, I had a pretty great experience. Um, and I can't really like say too, you know, it's like as everybody's going around and it's, and it's wonderful to, uh, to then see you have such success with this book. And I hope this book uh, sells like gangbusters. So yes. Uh, if I might just add, uh, I've decided if I ever have a cat, I'm going to name it Koki Flo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that is so a good name. <laughs> thanks so much, Nick, for organizing this. Yeah, Nick, you, Nick did a lot of the a lot of the heavy lifting, like most of the heavy lifting. So thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And I know, I know uh, we kind of skipped over you, Yoon. Was there any other final thoughts you want to say before, as we wrap up here? No, I just wanted to um, thank thank everybody for joining, 
this book talk and thank you Nick for organizing everything and creating the Kahoot quiz, which was a lot of work, I know that. Um, and, and thank you again, Dr. Greenwald for everything. Oh. And I hope to see you guys soon in person one day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody, take Thanks, care. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Stay safe everyone. Take care.